Welcome to the first session of the lecture series called Anxiety, Angst. What we will be doing in this series is read some texts of different authors dealing with the theme or topic of anxiety. We will be starting with Sigmund Freud's text The Uncanny from 1919. And basically how it will work is you see the primary source, the text on the left hand side of the screen. And on the right hand side, I've made some notes um, with guiding questions, a basic outline of the structure and argumentation of the text. Um, and um, I will read into the text um, with you and hopefully um, in combination with the notes we can come into some kind of discussion and this will be um, primarily um, in the mode of, of the learner. So um, in a state of mind where um, we try to be like um, really as far as it is possible for us presuppositionless about the topic or rather question our presupposition. So, um, this means that we already have like some kind of assumption what uh, angst or anxiety uh, designates or what it grasps, what it um, conceptually describes. So what kind of, um, we fill it with ca some kind of meaning with some kind of experiential content, um, probably every one of us. And we try to, um, I mean, we cannot do away in on some level we can't do away with it but um, this uh, series and um, the different sessions with the different texts are the, um, are the possibility give us the possibility to unfold um, and to to, um, to 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 really dive into um, the topic and to, to um, de-distance to the topic um, in some sense so to near us to get near to get close to the topic and unfold it um, like in a different manner, one could say. Um, we will see this with Sigmund Freud. And so basically this is kind of um, the first um, outline of, of, of how, how we will work in this series. And before going into the text, um, I will give a short, um, short introduction um, to, um, let's say, the, the, the topic of anxiety uh, already seen in lights uh, in light of, of, of the text we will be reading. So um, anxiety uh, is the feeling that does not deceive. That is what Jacques Lacan, a reader of Sigmund Freud, um, will say later. So after after Sigmund Freud, this assurance itself shows itself as a deceptive certainty. Why? Because for as much as we may be certain of anxiety as a feeling, it remains difficult to know what anxiety actually indicates to us. For anxiety differs from fear in that it is peculiarly objectless. This is something we will have to discuss and discover. So it's um, basically um, an assumption made um, after reading the text, but um, at, at, at this point in time, um, we, 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 will, we, we haven't read the text. So um, this is basically an assumption to be proven and um, to be argumented for. But um, this is just to give you like an outlook and to have some kind of clue where we will be going. For anxiety differs from fear in that it is peculiarly objectless. While we are afraid of concrete figures, situations, objects, anxiety is connected with an ambus malness that is not filled by any object. In this specific emptiness lies the connection of anxiety to a nothingness that is separated from any being and thus frightens us because it always surrounds us. If anxiety is such a basic mood, as Heidegger calls it, and Grundstimmung, then not only can we not escape it, but in dealing with anxiety, there's at the same time the possibility of dealing with the world. If not the possibility of dealing with the world at all, anxiety is as such a turning point, a transformative, um, transformative trait 
that we do not escape, but rather, in order to act, we must cross and face anxiety. So it's some kind of introduction, I hope. And uh, but basically, these are all assumptions um, taken from different authors, which we will read. So um, you heard the name Jacques Lacan, um, a psychoanalyst, um, but well trained in philosophy, um, who is also in contact with another name that I just mentioned, namely Martin Heidegger, from which we will also read um, some some text because he's uh, he's dealing with the theme or topic of anxiety as some kind kind of form. Um, that he calls like um, basic mood um, or a, a, a mood from a grounding mood and a Grundstimmung. Okay, so um, I would say this is enough for the introduction and um, let us go into the text of Sigmund Freud on the uncanny from 1919 as I mentioned. So I will I will read some part of it, maybe highlight some of the sentences which which will seem important um, uh, and and I will also have a look on my notes and um, as I said hopefully um, I can make some cross references or um, uh, go here and there like more in detail or in depth into um, some of the aspects um, of the text. It is only rarely that a psychoanalyst feels impelled to investigate the subject of aesthetics, even when aesthetics is understood to mean not merely the theory of beauty, but the theory of the qualities of feeling. He works in other planes of mental life and has little to do with those subdued emotional activities which, inhibited in their aims and dependent upon a multitude of concurrent factors, usually furnish the material for the study of aesthetics. But it does occasionally happen that he has to interest himself in some particular province of that subject. And then it usually proves to be a rather remote region of it and one that has been neglected in standard works. The subject of the uncanny is a province of this kind. It undoubtedly belongs to all that is terrible to all that arouses dread and creeping horror. It is equally certain, too, that the word is not always used in a clearly definable sense, so that it tends to coincide with whatever exists, dread, excites dread. Yet we may expect that it implies some intrinsic quality which justifies the use of a special name. One is curious to know what this peculiar quality is which allows us to distinguish as uncanny certain things within the boundaries of what is fearful. As good as nothing is to be found upon this subject, in elaborate treatises on aesthetics, which in general prefer to concern themselves with what is beautiful, attractive and sublime, that is, with feelings of a positive nature, with the circumstances and the objects that call them forth, rather than with the opposite feelings of unpleasantness and repulsion. I know of only one attempt in medical psychological literature, a fertile but not exhaustive paper by Ernst Jentsch. But I must confess that I have not made a very thorough examination of the bio bibliography, especially the foreign literature relating to this present modest contribution of mine, for reasons which must be obvious at this time so that my paper is presented to the reader without any claim of priority. In his study of the uncanny Jentsch quite rightly lays stress on the obstacle presented by the fact that people vary so very greatly in their sensitivity to this quality of feeling. The writer of the present contribution indeed must himself plead guilty to a special obtuseness in the matter, where extreme delicacy of perception would be more in place. It is long since he has experienced or heard of anything which has, given him, which has given him an uncanny impression and he will be obliged to translate himself into that state of feeling and to awaken in himself the possibility of it before he begins. Still, difficulties of this kind make themselves felt powerfully in many other branches of aesthetics. We need not 
on this count despair of finding instances in which the quality in question will be recognized without hesitation by most people. Two courses are open to us at the start. Either we can find out what meaning has come to be attached to the word uncanny in the course of its history, or we can collect all those properties of persons, things, sensations, experiences and situations which arouse in us the feeling of uncanniness, and then infer the unknown nature of the uncanny from what they all have in common. I will say at once that both courses lead to the same result. The uncanny is that class of the terrifying which leads back to something long known to us. Once very familiar. How this is possible, in what circumstances the familiar can become uncanny and frightening, I shall show in what follows. Let me also add that my investigation was actually begun by collecting a number of individual cases and only later received confirmation after I had examined what language could tell us. In this discussion, however, I shall follow the opposite course. The German broad word unheimlich is obviously the opposite of heimlich, heimisch, meaning familiar, native, belonging to the home. And we are tempted to conclude that what is uncanny is frightening precisely because it is not known and familiar. Naturally, not everything which is new and unfamiliar is frightening. However, the relation cannot be inverted. We can only say that what is novel can easily become frightening and uncanny. Some new things are frightening, but not by any means all. Something has to be added to what is novel and unfamiliar to make it uncanny. On the whole, Jensch did not get beyond this relation of the uncanny to the novel and unfamiliar. He ascribes the essential factors in the production of the feeling of uncanniness to intellectual uncertainty, so that the uncanny would always be that in which one does not know where one is, as it were. The better oriented in his environment a person is, the less readily would he get the impression of something uncanny in regard to the object and events in it. It is not difficult to see that this definition is incomplete, and we will therefore try to proceed beyond the equation of unheimlich with unfamiliar. We will first turn to other languages, but foreign dictionaries tell us nothing new, perhaps only because we speak a different language. Indeed, we get the impression that many languages are without a word for this particul particular variety of what is fearful. Okay, so let's stop here for a moment and um, I will mark some of the passages um, which seems of particular importance for us. So, so Freud is starting um, with his position or like um, telling us from his position as a psychoanalyst. So this term is already introduced and um, we will later in this series um, discuss what a psychoanalyst um, is doing and uh, what the psychoanalyst um, is. So there's a great text from Alenka Sumpancic, Why Psychoanalysis? And we will dive into that topic later. Um, but um, um, as a basic working definition, um, we, we can derive from the word easily that, um, that a psychoanalyst is right. He's analyzing um, the psyche. <laughs> so of course, this is what the word is saying. So analyzing, um, we can firstly take it as some kind of form of dissecting and um, uh, like um, separating and um, preparating out different structures and also the relation of structures and um, let's say the functional aspects in regard of, um, of let's say systemic um, a, a systemic working um, as, or, or a systemic um, apparatus as Freud will call it, um, the, the apparatus of the psyche or the, the psychic apparatus. So, um, of course, this, this is um, like, this notion is loaded um, and, and we, we have to unpack it and discuss it. So uh, how can he speak of an apparatus? Um, um, 
probably you know that that Freud has um, also some some uh, th took some concepts or some some con conceptual underpinnings from of um, mechanics and thermodynamic and uh, we will we will discuss this later because it's like a really interesting and particularly um, uh, let's say arguable um, aspect of, of psychoanalysis um, especially um, like Freud is, is proposing it or like developing it okay so He's starting with saying it is only rarely that the psychoanalyst feels impelled to investigate the subject of aesthetics, even when aesthetics is understood to mean not merely the theory of beauty, but the theory of the qualities of feeling. So, I mean, this first sentence um, is already really interesting. So um, aesthetics, we can basically take it as um, so it's it's not it's on the one side, it's it's the thinking after um, the beautiful, um, as, as Freud says that, that the beautiful, the, the attractive and sublime. So um, this is um, like a, a form or um, a, a field um, of philosophy as um, we know aesthetics and perhaps um, let's say in Kant or in um, Baumgarten, who develops, uh, greatly develops this field of aesthetically um, or, or philosophizing, thinking after um, what aesthetic, aesthetic is. Um, but when we go down um, or back to the Greek roots, uh, aesthesis, um, of course, we, we can, could unpack this um, further, but uh, let's go for the moment with, uh, with, um, with that uh, aesthesis um, can mean some some form of perception even if this translation is um, taken um, has to be taken with some kind of form of um, carefulness because um, perception is already um, the notion is already loaded so this is something we will see um, or we will discover and find in in, in um, a great deal of philosophy that that the notions uh, we are using in everyday um, language and in everyday dealings um, are already packed, highly packed with um, with philosophical um, um, not only assumption but but um, they, they are conceptual vehicles. And um, so this can be on the positive side. Let's say um, they can be conceptual vehicles um, for making us understand and giving us an access to our environment or um, like the, the, the state and, and um, the, the all encompassing that, that we are kind of, um, that we find ourselves in, like our being in the world, as Heidegger will say. And um, so they can be conceptually, um, conceptual vehicles and entrances, accesses. But on the other side, um, and this is where the, the, the carefulness uh, should be evoked, um, I would say, is um, that they already um, bring with them as conceptual vehicles structures, and um, not not only that, but they they um, they speak and address particularly part particular um, modes in our conceiving of um, of things, of a state of affairs, of of the world. Um, particular modes that that are um, that that we don't know um, as starting um, in philosophy or starting in, in theory uh, we don't know yet that um, that these modes and these kind of um, tools and um, basically functional structures they were developed at some kind of point um, in the his in the history of thought in the history of thinking of theory and um, for example, like logic, um, as um, we now know it as a discipline, um, but logic and, and reason are particularly, they are, um, they are interventions into us um, making sense of the surrounding, making sense of our being in the world. And as such, they um, grant us access in um, or they can grant us access and, and make understanding possible. But on the other side, they, um, they force us into, one could even say, 
or they um, they um, yeah not not press us perhaps also press us into but but we don't have um, we don't even have a decision right so so th this is the important aspect so we make use of these um, of these modes of thinking um, quite naturally as it were um, and um, or, or better better to say we fall in these modes of thinking in these techniques of thinking one perhaps could also say and um, we don't even know that that this is a decision made and um, that maybe um, some kind of uh, some some aspects of what it means or what it can mean um, to be in the world um, are perhaps um, shut off from from um, from our conceptions or from from our thinking uh, thinkingly dealing um, with the world from our practices at all just because we we fall into uh, like let's say the technique of of logic and reason okay so but we take aesthetics um i will close uh the bracket here we will take aesthetics as um as um, the perception of something so the subject of aesthetics um can be um the theory of beauty um, but the theory of the qualities of feeling um, this is what Freud says so beside um, um, taking from or, or going um, going going with the term perception so uh, we perceive um, something or we perceive um, we perceive us being in the world um, and um, we, we, we kind of encounter um, moments of beauty of attractiveness of the sublime maybe um, in terms of being in the world and um, so we can go with this notion of aesthesis and build out of this like a theory um, from uh, theory comes from theoria um, which which first means in in greek like um, the uh, the view or the outlook or um, the sightful participation in um, the ceremony um, of a god or of the gods and of course later then now we have kind of um, this notion of theory in contrast to praxis uh, in which is kind of the the um, the, the mental conceptual mental conceptualization of a theme in terms of um, pure reason or pure thought um, which kind of abstract um, or is abstracted or gets abstracted from um, from our full immersion into the world and um, also from from uh, the the moods um, or the feeling the qualities of feelings that we are dealing with and um, so this is um, why it is interesting that Freud um, here says that um, that so, so um, his point is that that um, that it is in in his view at least it's it's rarely that psychoanalysts or psychologists feels impe impelled to investigate the subject of perception or aesthetics um, and this in the light that that aesthetics can not only mean the theory of beauty but the theory of the qualities of feeling so his point is that um, as psycho psychologists or psychoanalysts are dealing with analyzing the psyche or um, asking after the logos of the psyche the logic of the psyche so we will come at some other point at, at, um, at where the term logic derived or derives from um, but it can can like concern itself with the qualities of feeling and as the psyche we would i mean one could assume and and also like have the um the experiential grounding that um that our psyche is highly um, concerned or uh, even captured by qualities of feeling so this is why 
Freud uh, wonders and um, feels, uh, feels this as a notable observation that, um, that it hasn't been yet um, a popular topic among psychoanalyst psychologists. And of course he will, um, this is why this is the first sentence, uh, he will delve into um, the topic of um, the subject of aesthetics as not only a theory of beauty, but a theory of the qualities of feeling. Okay, so um, let's move on. He works in other planes of mental life and has little to do with those subdued emotional activities which in inhibited in their aims and dependent upon a multitude of concurrent factors usually furnish the material for the study of aesthetics. But it does occasionally happen that he has to interest himself in some particular province of that subject and then it usually proves to be a rather remote region of it and one that has been neglected in standard works. So um, he furthers his observation um, or his remark that um, aesthetics as the theory of the qualities of feeling has not been yet a popular um, or highly discussed topic in terms of psychology or psychoanalysis. And um, even though um, it, 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 um, aspects of it play obviously a role um, in terms of the psyche and analyzing the psyche, and going into the logic of the psyche. And um, so he then moves on and says that, that, um, that a specific region, remote region of it um, has been neglected um, especially. And this is the subject of the uncanny. So he will, he will go on. The subject of the uncanny is a province of this kind. So it's not only the subject of the uncanny, but other provinces of well has been neglected, but he will focus on the uncanny. It undoubtedly belongs to all that is terrible, to all that arouses dread and creeping horror. It is equally certain too that the word is not always used in a clearly definable sense, so that it tends to coincide with, with whatever excites dread. Yet, yet we may expect that it implies some intrinsic quality which justifies the use of a special name. One is curious to know what this peculiar quality is, which allows us to distinguish as uncanny certain things within the boundaries of what is fearful. Okay, so um, he unpacks this now. So the subject of the uncanny, which um, is a region in terms of aesthetics, which concerns itself with the qualities of feelings and which was given a special name, namely the uncanny. So under this realm of phenomena um, or, or a specific realm of phenomena in terms of aesthetics um, was given the name uncanniness. And he's now asking or curious to know what is what are the peculiar qualities um, which distinguish as uncanny certain things because there must be something differentiating um, the uncanny let's say from of the boundaries um, of what is grasped under the notion of the fearful otherwise um, why is there um, a, a special name right and so this is the first time we can go into the notes because uh, one of the guiding question namely the first one that will um, concern us or haunt us even perhaps um, during this lecture series is the question, what is anxiety? So the basic ontological question, meaning um, a question concerning with the being of a particular subject, namely anxiety in this case. So what is, so here we have um, the copula um, that derives from um, the verb being and um, so, so the question ask, asks after the being of anxiety, which can also be um, restated um, that um, it asks after the essence. Um, this is the Latin translation of um, being. Um, 
one could argue. So um, in, in German, it's um, called a Wesen. So what is the realm of anxiety? One could also say, what, what makes anxiety anxiety? And, and Freud asking this in terms of the uncanny, what makes, what makes certain things uncanny? And um, in, in the same vein as it makes them uncanny, differentiate it from certain phenomena a state of affairs or things that we call fearful so this is um, basically an assumption to be proved but yeah this is um, like our most um, pressing guiding question what is anxiety then um, further we will ask and this is also evoked here in freud um, what does our aesthetic dealings with anxiety consist in? How do we deal with aesthetically, in terms of aesthetics, in terms of perception um, and uh, the thinking after aesthesis perception? Um, how do we deal with um, anxiety? And um, in spe specific, um, weaving this text with the uncanny. So how do we comport two words? Um, things that are a state of affairs that are uncanny and um, also we ask um, how can we analyze like um, how can we how, how can we um, specifically um, describe and dissect our our dealings with um, with what is uncanny so um, so how can our relations to these, our practices be analyzed? Let's say, for example, um, we, we go to a movie um, to a, and, and watch a horror movie. So, um, of course, we could discuss um, if, uh, if there may be um, a, a quality of feeling that, that is getting evoked or that can be evoked, um, that can be designated as, as uncanny. Um, but I would... I would um, like intuitively assume also from my um, experience that that one could have this feeling of uncanniness like watching a movie and um, now what does this say that we um, what does this say about the theme and about us and um, about the re like the relation um, that we have of uncanny phenomena or state of affairs um, that, that we actively, um, as it seems, search situations where we feel uncanny, um, namely going into a movie and watching a, a movie which will um, perhaps, um, in, like um, by, intu by intention, but um, per per perhaps also by chance, um, comport us um, or uh, bring us into this kind of quality of feeling which is described by uncanniness. Okay. So let's let's get a little bit into um, into the uncanny and the notion of the uncanny, and then we will um, return to the text, right? So um, in English, it's particularly interesting that we have the un before the canny. So um, it seems, and this is on another paper, that the un um, is kind of the brand or marker. Um, of the uncanny, right? So, um, because as Freud says, um, or will say, um, we have read, right, that um, the German word unheimlich, which also has the um, prefix an in it, is obviously the opposite of heimlich, heimisch meaning familiar native belonging to the home. So this is this being said, right? Um, the an can be designated as kind of the brand or marker of um, what it is to be uncanny, namely n being not homely, being not familiar, um, not belonging to the home. And uh, we have to unpack what what this means. And if, like, let's say, the trusted, the comfortable, cozy, and homely is like in a um, strict, um, that is perhaps even categorical opposition to uh, what is hi hidden, covered, concealed, um, 
um, and then perhaps in, in the further sense uncanny or um, by further deliberation to be designated as uncanny. Okay, so so we have um, at the start of Freud's text we have or we, we can witness Freud referring to Ernst Jentsch and here he says in his study of the uncanny Jentsch quite rightly lays stress on the obstacle presented by the fact that people vary, vary so very greatly in their sensitivity to this quality of feeling and I know of only one attempt in medical psychological literature a fertile but not exhaustive paper by Ernst Jentsch okay so he is mentioning Jentsch and um, and kind of um, cheering him as as like um, a author and a researcher who's like investigating into the topic of the uncanny um, but at the same time he says that a fertile but not exhaustive paper so um, he wants to push against Ernst Jentsch um, that is some something we can already witness here at the beginning and um, the initial thesis of um, Ernst Jentsch is that the uncanny belongs to the realm of phenomena of the fearful. So it's the sort of scary terrible that traces back to the notorious, the ever so familiar, um, trusted acquaintance. 